been a good time to be alive so that we can, we can be here when the great outpouring of God's spirit, because I believe it's coming. Amen? Amen? All right, I got a super long message for you today. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to try not get... I'm trying not to get tied up in each point because we will be here for a long time. But let me ask everybody something. Have you ever heard of these three guys? Yes. <laughs> Amen. That's pretty good. She's prophetic. She already knew what I was going to say. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. How many of y'all ever heard those three names? Oh, wait a minute now. Let me see some hands. How many of y'all ever heard those three names? Okay. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? All right. Well, hey. I mean, he said it like rejoicing, but you're not going to rejoice when I tell you what those names mean. You know, you see, what I'm about to take you into a journey in the book of Daniel, and I'm going to try to get this story down because there is this, like, incredible truth in this story, okay? And uh, anybody going through something, some fire, some stuff? Okay, well, you're going to want to hear this. And, um, but these three guys, we've always glorified their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo, because uh, they went in that fire furnace. But I want to show you why they went into that fire and why were they victorious. And, and these three names did not bring them through, okay? So let's just go. But even if, that's the title. But even, but even if... So let's get started. Here in Daniel 3, 1, it starts off with King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Made a gold statue, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. He set it up on the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. You know, kind of simple. He put this big giant idol up of himself, an image, and he wanted people to worship. But in this one scripture, that we got some truth we need to take a look at, okay? First of all, who is Nebuchadnezzar? Well, it's simple. He's the king of Babylon. But I want you to hold that thought, because when I get to what Babylon means, then you'll see. So he's the king, all right? He's the leader. He's the guy that, that uh, came in and destroyed the temple and so forth in Israel and uh, led everybody captive. So number two, what does the name Dora mean in Hebrew? It means to circle or dwelling, Dura, a place in Babylon, uh, to gyrate, to move in a circle, to remain, dwell. Now, real quick, when we find out in a minute who Nebuchadnezzar is, but this idol set up in Dura, and the people are, are trapped in the midst of it, going in circles. Have you been, felt like you were going in circles in life? You know, you get up, you go to work, you come home, you go to the grocery, you raise the kids, da 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 <laughs> It's just a big circle of life. This is where people dwell. There are Christians today dwelling in Dura, okay? And uh, because of religion or having to do with false teachings, all right? So anyway, so this is this place where he sets this idol up in Dura, and that's what it means to walk in circles forever. It's your dwelling place. What does the name Babylon mean in Hebrew? That's important. Confusion. It's the word Babel, where we get the Tower of Babel back in the, in the Old Testament, okay? To babble, to just make noise type of thing. Okay, this is out of Strong's Concordance. So, confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 tells us, for God is not the author of confusion. Well, who is? But of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So God is not the author of confusion. God's not the author of walking around in circles where you finally say, is this it? Is this all there is in life? So God is not the author of that because the road to God is straight. It's not rep repetitive over and over. So who is King Nebuchadnezzar? Uh, who does King Nebuchadnezzar represent? The king of confusion, the devil. So we got this story here that I'm going to continue reading. We got to get the characters right because God, God doesn't just give us a story. He implants all kinds of truth into the story. Jesus talked in stories, parables, put all kinds of truth in there. You can preach on his parables 
so many different ways because there's so much truth in here. So in this chapter, we have this tremendous truth that we want to look at, okay? So he is the king of confusion, king of Babylon. So he is the devil himself. So now we go into Daniel chapter 3, 2, 2, 2 and 3. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to assemble the, the straps, perfects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to attend the dedication to the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the straps, perfects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the prov province uh, assembled for the dedication of the statue the king had set up. Then they stood before the statue Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Question five, what do all these people under Nebuchadnezzar represent? What are these? These are the officials, okay? The ones that go make people do things under Nebuchadnezzar. Ephesians 6 tells us, for our battle is not against flesh and blood. You're not fighting against people, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. You know, sickness, cancer, diseases, this all came in with the curse, and Satan has access to that stuff to make that happen. You can go read the book of Job. He caused skin worms to crawl in and out of Job's body when he was allowed to afflict him. We are allowed to be afflicted. God allows us to be afflicted. And we, and we just cannot turn and say, no, 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 you know, there's no evil in God. This isn't evil because affliction is progress. I've already preached on that, what the pit meant, that it's crushing and it's bringing forth truth and it's bringing forth stuff inside of us, it's bringing it alive. So when we are afflicted, hey, we, we're not exempt. If Jesus Christ himself was crushed, then, we're, then we will be crushed too for a resurrection, for healing, for deliverance, for you to get that truth in your head down into your hearts, okay? So what we got here is we got all these authorities and powers that was under Nebuchadnezzar. They were the ones that would force people to do what they didn't want to do. Okay? So these are the principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. You know, I've said this so many times. The president is not our problem. It's a demon that's in there to get in a hold of the governments. It's a spirit of Antichrist that's eventually going to bring all the, the, um, the religions and all of the governments together under Antichrist, and he's going to try to rule the world, okay? So in Daniel 3, 4 through 7, And a herald loudly proclaimed, People of every nation and language, you are commanded. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zether, zether lyre, um, harp, drum, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So now you can see that these officials are going to force the people to worship an idol. Okay? But whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and every kind of music, people of every nation and language fell down and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Everybody did. Am I telling the truth? No. <laughs> Good. You're with me. Amen. What do all these musical instruments and its music, what does that represent? Okay, we need to know what it means. Okay, but if Nebuchadnezzar is the devil, his officials are the principalities, power, and wickedness, the idol is just false religion and whatever it may be that he wants you to fall down and worship other than God, then what are the music? It's all false religions and worship of false gods. All right? You know, I mean, the, the world, the secular world out there, the music that they play, they're not, it's not all demonic as far as that. Some write love songs and stuff of that nature, you know. But if you look at music in general, you see Satan, the devil, was the head of the choir, the worshiping team, and they sang, and he rebelled, and he took out the choir. He, so now the demons are going around and getting people hooked on music, and they don't realize the power of the tongue and confession. It's so powerful they got you saved, and they're just singing the lyrics to secular music. They don't even know what they're singing, 
They don't understand that they could be singing themselves into a pit, into a hole, into disaster, and eventually maybe even into hell by the music that's out there because it exalts worldliness, lust, or I can go on, on sex, drugs, all kind of stuff, okay? But like I said, not all songs are demonic, but any song that is not singing about God it's still, it's still going to lead you in the wrong direction. You know, I've heard many people that after they got saved, they, they didn't want to give up country music. Well, there's a lot of good gospel country songs. Amen? No problem. I didn't tell anybody to give it up to begin with. But we need to analyze what we're listening to. Man, man, they got some stuff. When I was in the world and I had, I was into Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and all kind of stuff like that in the 70s, you know. And I think about some of the lyrics that I was singing along with them, you know. And, uh, man, I mean, I was just in agreement. Alice Cooper, he finally got saved, praise the Lord. But uh, some of them have got saved. Many of them died, OD'd, and everything else, you know. And that's what the culture and the people were following. Well, the same thing with this idol, man. They, when you hear all this music, all this noise, all this confusion, you know then, drop to your knees and worship this idol. Okay? Or, then comes the threat. The devil's always threatening. Daniel 3.8. Some Chaldeans took this occasion to come forward and maliciously accuse the Jews. All right? Now, wh who are these Chaldeans, you know? Who is accusing us before God? You know, and the answer is right there, the devil. He's accusing you. Now you see here, I want to show you something. I don't want to jump ahead because I want to get into these names. These names are awesome. Um, but, but who is accusing you? How many of y'all have sinned since you've been saved? The rest of y'all are lying. There you go. Raise your hand. You're sinning because you're lying. <laughs> Every one of us, I mean, we're dealing with our flesh all the time. How many of y'all have let out trash out of your mouth since you've been a Christian? You know, we change things up. So that we don't want to use the curse word, but then we still ain't getting angry. We were talking about that this morning, you know. It, the Lord's not looking at or listening to what we're saying. He's looking at the heart. Where's it coming from? So it could be normal words that speak in death because of the way in which we're speaking them. So, but that's our flesh. We have the flesh. We have a carnal nature. And, and it will never see heaven. It's going to be changed. And we have a body like under the Lord, perfect. But your inner being, your spirit is born again. It's perfect before God. So even though you, you have a sin nature and you're still fighting and struggling against it, when you, when you die, your spirit's going to go right up to the judgment seat of Christ and all the bad stuff's going to burn up and the good stuff gets a reward and then to heaven you go. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I like what one guy said I was listening to and he just, he just told um, the unsaved, he said, he said, you know the difference between you and me? He said, it's not that I don't sin, because I do, but I know that it is sin, and I ask for forgiveness. <laughs> I said, that's just so simple. They, don't, they just don't care. They just don't think what they're doing is wrong. So in Revelation 12, it says this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God um, and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the, and, um, and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. It's going to happen about mid-trib when that happens. But let me tell you about the cues of brethren, what he's doing. All right? Now, I've heard it preached, and it always seems to be preached. Maybe there's other messages that will preach it the way I'm going to share it. But they're actually going up before the gates of heaven and accusing you before God. All right? But I don't see that because the kingdom of heaven is within you. God has put the whole kingdom of heaven within you. God, the Holy Spirit, is in you. So he's not going up into heaven to the gates. He's going to the gates here. Now let me explain this. When you sin and you feel that guilt and then you repent, then that's a great thing. But how many of y'all, when you're going through something, 
You start going, oh man, I know I failed God here. I, I know that, I, you know, I sinned. And, and I know, you know, I, I ask for forgiveness. But maybe all this happened because I sinned. See, he's right there at the gates accusing you. You don't deserve healing. You did this. And he's telling the truth. We have failed. But we have repented. You understand? He's not going to go up there. I don't see. Because then I don't know about it. He's going to make sure I know about it. So that he can weaken my faith. So he can make me doubt. So he can begin to make me believe that I'm not worthy to be healed. And then I know. I say, I'm not worthy. I know that. But let me tell you something. My flesh is unworthy. And that's where the sickness is. But my spirit is worthy. And you want to know why? It isn't because you've done anything fancy or anything good or you've, or you've read your Bible through once or twice a year. It isn't because of any of that. It's because you have taken your faith and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe that he died for your sins and he rose again for you and now you live and will live forever with him and you have been made worthy by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Period. Amen. All right? And this is what we have to come back against that way of thinking because he's throwing it out at through the gates and you're hearing him and you're responding to it when you start to go man I went to the doctor and it's not getting better it's getting worse okay with what you're gonna do but what if but even if even if what even if he doesn't heal you are you still going to believe? You see, the trying of our faith is as precious gold. It's precious gold. You're going to be tried. Why? Because God wants to increase your faith. He wants to increase the spiritual stuff in your life. He wants to get the head knowledge you have down in your heart so that you're not just a doer, but a believer, okay? A believer. People do a lot of things but they're really not believing. They're really trying to work themselves into God's good graces. So it's not by our good works. We do good works because we're Christians. Not to earn anything. You can't earn it. You can't go work and receive it. You got it because you used your faith and you believed in it. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. And that's how you attain to the promises of God. None of us in this place and none of us in this world anywhere is worthy. They said, good master, the guy said to Jesus. He said, who's good? There's nobody good. Only God is good. But I've done all these things. Man, he's just started to say, yeah, I've done it all. But it's something that you haven't done. Give away everything you got and give it to the poor and come follow me. And he couldn't do it because the riches held him down. You know? We, we are always, the flesh is always corrupt. It's always trying to, to do something to, to, to earn something from God. And boy, when the, when the going gets tough, we even we get tough with how we start declaring. Okay? Um, and then the devil comes. He starts telling you how unworthy you are. You know? You know, Bruce, that's what he's telling you. He's saying, you're not worthy. You say, I am worthy by the blood of Jesus. No, my flesh isn't worthy, but my spirit is. You know, you're a child of God. God the Father is your father. He's your dad. He has adopted you. He didn't adopt you before. He adopted you when you used your faith. He went, that's my child. And he adopted you in, and you became a child of God. And it's not by paying tithe or offerings or, or reading your Bible through all of this. This is just stuff that we do, given to God and so forth. But it's by faith in Him. By having a relationship. Sitting at His feet, listening to His voice. He's got the answer for you. He's, he's only trying, and the reason why it hasn't happened right now is because He wants to increase your faith. The disciples went, increase our faith. He said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed. Amen? Just the size of that. But then he starts to talk about this giant tree that grows into. And people start lodging in its branches. It's in the midst of the storm that people are listening. You know, 
if, if we were to see Jesus and he didn't die on a cross, he would still be God, right? But just think how more he's worthy to help you because he didn't just stay in heaven. He came to earth and died on a cross. He yielded his body to be beat to. It was, it was unrecognizable as a human being, it says. He, he just said, go at it. And the devils came and went at him with everything they had. But they couldn't take his life. He laid it down. Into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. And he gave up his spirit on that cross. So, who are we to say? He does not know what I'm going through. What? He experienced everything that you will ever go through on that cross. Everything. You know, they say that it says in Scripture, he became sent for us, and some people say he became a child molester. No, no, no. That's not what it means in Greek. It means in Greek, he knows exactly what a child molester is doing. He knows exactly what every sinner is doing. He knows exactly what you're doing as a Christian. He knows everything. And all of our feelings have been laid upon him. Amen? Amen. Daniel 3, 9 through 12 says, Then said the king, then said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. As you, king, have issued the decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, sether, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music must fall down and worship the gold statue. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the fiery blazing uh, furnace of blazing fire. There are some Jews you have appointed to manage to, uh, and the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego these men have ignored you, the king. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. So now we see these three names. Okay? This is not these guys' names. These are names, if you go back in Daniel 1, verse 7, they, that Nebuchadnezzar changed their names. Now I want to tell you something. It's interesting that I'm saying that to you. I'm going to give it to you in just a second that he changed their names to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's amazing to me because the story is always calling them that when they go on the fire and so forth, that we know those names, but we're not acquainted with Haniel, Mishael, and Azariah. We're not, we, you know, some of y'all raised your hands and so forth, but we're going to look at this, okay? So, these three. So first off, who is Shadrach? Now, why, look at what his name means in Babylonian language, all right? His name means, it's from the moon god, and it means servant of sin. Now, you see, this is an amazing thing. I'm going to show you all three names. The devil has changed your name. The devil has changed your name to, you're a servant of sin. You're a sinner. God doesn't call you a sinner. God calls you a child. Okay? But the devil calls you a sinner, and when you yield to that way of thinking, you will sin. A sinner is a person who sins. Okay? His real name is Hananiah, which means Jah, which is the short version of Jehovah. Jah has favored. You can see the devil wanting to change somebody's name from that I don't want him to know that he is or she is favored by God. Boy, if he ever catches hold of that, that's going to change his whole way of thinking about himself. No, I'm going to keep pounding him that he's a servant of sin. You cannot stop sinning. You can't stop lusting. You can't stop doing all of this. You like all of that lounging and, and playing and all the worldly stuff. You like that better than going to church. And he just keeps on pounding you with that stuff. And you don't even realize it. Christians just, man, I just, I just don't like going to church. I just, you know, it's all right, I want to go, but I just don't find any joy in it. You know? and, and where is that coming from? It's not even church. You are the church. What you're saying is, is that you, you, you have separated yourself from who you are. We are the body of Christ. We are the church, the church of the living God. 
which means holy habitation of the presence of God. But when you start saying church here, house of refuge, a building, when you start saying that, I just find it kind of boring. You see, you have separated yourself from being part of the church. It's now it's just a building. It's just a place. This is the place we meet. I try to give you a message to straighten you up and to edify and lift you up. I try, amen, that's my job, amen. I'm to reprove, rebuke, and edify. I'm a pastor here. But this isn't it. His church, look at each other. That's the church. Boy, if the devil could ever keep you from knowing that the real name here means Jah is favored. He is favored in your life, and you are his, you know, favored, highly favored by him. Who is Meshach? Who, now his name, see all three of these names, matter of fact, even Daniel, we're not looking at his name right now. It's after a Babylonian god. But it's the moon god that he's changed their names to, okay? A-K-U right here. So watch this. Notice that Meshach and Mishael, they're kind of similar, okay? But one means who is like the moon god? Eku, whatever his name is. Yeah, Eku, yeah, or the devil. His real name is Mishael, which means who is like God. That's interesting. So the devil has changed his name to image some idol, some false god, when his real name is to image the likeness of the true God. And that, see, that's what the devil also would want you to fall under. You're not that special because you are a sinner. You are imaging sin. Hmm. And it's true. Because the world sees the outward, right? But only God sees the heart. And so, we start trying. Now, this is commendable, but you're going to fail. You start trying to be holy. Don't you try? You know, you want to scream and yell, but you know better. So you get a hold of yourself, at least sometimes, <laughs> before you scream and yell. You know, we, we are trying to be holy. Okay? But the devil's got you pegged. You can't be holy. You see, you're, you're, you're in the image of the moon god. Wow. But God's saying, you already are holy. You already are righteous. So quit trying to be holy and be holy. See, that makes no sense. No, not to the flesh. Not to the, the carnal mind. That's... Because everything in life, we're, we're being trained and being taught to do it. You go to school, they teach you. You know, you go to college, something they're teaching you, they're training you. You get a job, they train you in equipment or whatever. So we're always being trained to do it. But what you don't get, you see, somewhere along the line, they trained you to drive a car. Remember that? Remember the driver's ed? I don't know if any of you, if, 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 yeah, okay, good. <laughs> she remembers. Joey don't, he's too old. He don't forgot. Amen. Georgia remembers he's driving now. Driver's ed. They taught you. But here's something that you, you don't get. You see, you don't, even though they taught you to drive, you still got to drive by the Spirit. So until you get acclimated in driving, you're doing it by what they taught you. Stop sign, stop. It's amazing how you could stop at stop signs and don't even know. Did I stop at that stop? Because... You start, if you start driving by your spirit, you see, so we always learning. I remember picking up a guitar for the first time and it was like C chord. And I just waiting for my fingers to go there and I was like, I don't know what a C chord is. So I had to put them. It was amazing that day when I saw a C chord and I looked down and my fingers were in a C chord position. I was like, whoa! That was, I would say, I have achieved the C chord. <laughs> Let's move on to the G chord. And my hand went, what's that, you know? But now I know, I know where they are. I mean, my, it, somewhere in there there's this connection. You see, that's, that's when we begin to really be alive. Amen? 
See, you wasn't alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Yet you was alive to the world. You were going through all emotions. You were going in circles your whole life. I remember that day I walked out on my driveway and I just yelled up to God, Is this it? Is this life? Smoking heavy? Going to get cancer one day probably? And then my wife wants to have kids. What? You know? I don't even know how to raise myself, much less kids. You know? And I remember having that conversation with God. And the Lord's like, there's a lot of things you don't know yet. You know? And then I came, you know, and began to grow in the Lord, get saved and growing in the Lord. And, and, uh, and it's amazing, you know, that I'll be in the midst of preaching or teaching something, and somebody asks a question, and then the scripture pops into my head. Wow. How did that get there? It's inside. You see, you're coming alive now. You're going past the flesh. When Jesus died on the cross, there was something that was tremendous that happened right before he said, into your hands. You know what happened? The veil rent right down the middle. And the way onto the Holy of Holies became open to anybody. You know, when you got saved, something tremendous happened. You stepped from the flesh and tried to live the holy life. And now you can walk in by the blood of the Lamb, by the Spirit. You need to know. You need to know you're saved. John wrote, Beloved, I'm writing this to you because that you will know you have eternal life. So when you ask anything in my name, it shall be done. Because, because the name Michel says, we are like our God. We're not like the moon God. We're like Jehovah. Jesus Christ. We're being transformed from glory to glory, the scripture says. Who is Abednego? Servant, a servant of Nebo. I thought that was something out of Disneyland or something. A servant of Nebo, the Babylonian God of wisdom. That's, you know, out of all three names, I found this one the most intriguing. The one that really went, whoa. Okay? And then, but his real name is Azariah, which means Jah has helped or Jah will protect. Now, you see, when you get a name and it has a meaning, it just means I know. I know I'm protected. Okay? But let me go back to this one here, this, this particular god, Nebo. Where is Nebo? like a Disney character but he's not he's more he's worse than that because it's the spirit of the devil and the wisdom that's being talked about here is the wisdom of the world so the first two is kind of you know kind of like a threat but this one here is like the devil saying hey if you bow down to me I'll give you all these kingdoms who do you say that to Amen. In the garden. If you just bow down to me. And he was right. He owned all the kingdoms of the world. It doesn't become the kingdom of Christ until revelation towards the end. But it belonged to him. He didn't, Jesus didn't argue with him. I'll give you all the kingdoms if you bow down and worship me. You shall worship the Lord thy God. Him alone shall you serve. The wisdom of a demonic spirit. Hmm. But we have... The wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God says, there's an ever-present help at the time of need. His name is Jesus. Holy Spirit is right there. It's yes and amen. Amen? So here's these three names. So the devil changed their names. He changed Daniel's name to Bel de Shazal or something like that, which was another Babylonian god. But they still had their original name. They still had... The original name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Daniel 3, uh, 13 through 15. Then in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the God's statue I have set up? Now, if you're ready... When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the settler, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue I made. But if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into the furnish, furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? 
So what is going on here? The devil will always give you a chance to stop following God. And he will offer you something to persuade you. Okay? He'll always do that. If you just buckle. If you just, just yield up a little bit on that Jesus stuff. Okay? And um, it's, it's okay for you to do this or that, whatever. He'll just, he'll just tell you, man, look, it's all good. It's all good. Just stop that Jesus stuff. Stop believing in him like you're doing. You know, it's, just, it's getting you nowhere. Look, you're sick. Where's God at? You know, like I just found out that I got prostate cancer. I found out by on my portal that the thing started seven years ago. It was so tiny, though. But I could follow it through the PSA um, stuff they take out of your blood and how it has curved up. Now it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. But it's not a big deal. It's not a big My God's bigger than cancer. My God's bigger than pff, everything, man. You know, I know what I'm going to hear from the doctors. I know what I'm going to hear. And I'm not going to say no to any treatment. I'm just saying I know what I'm going to hear. But he's going to hear something too. And said, I'm, I will pray about what direction to go after you give me my options. And then I'll seek God. If he says get treatment, then I'll do it. If he says don't, then I won't. I mean, it's just simple as that. I'm not, I'm not against doctors because they're operating under the wisdom of God. They wouldn't even have the wisdom they have if it wasn't for, you know, God. They have advanced. It's also in the book of Daniel. It says knowledge shall be increased. Amen? So I'm not afraid of any of that. That's not a big deal. I'm not afraid of government. I don't care who's president. I know who I want to be president, and I know how bad they're running the country, and we, if we're going to become communistic, well, that's another deal. But when Antichrist comes, he's going to make what's going on like it's child's play. That's why I plan on getting out of here, one way or the other. I'm either going by rapture or by guillotine. <laughs> that's true. They're going to be seeking the, the elect to cut their heads off, you know. So either way, I'm getting out of here but, uh, and getting up there with Jesus because I had enough of this mess anyway down here. You know, too many children being abused and innocent and being killed and everything else, and they want to keep doing it, you know. So anyway, but my God is far bigger. You know, cancer is a name, but there's a name that I serve. If I had the name of Jesus, cancer will bow a knee. It will yield. Huh, Bruce? Bruce is praying for me. I'm praying for him. It just so happens we both got at the same time. But a God doesn't fail. He never leaves us. Never leaves us. You got that? Never leaves us. You know? Amen. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace a blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if, and that's the title of my message right there, but even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. I want you to know right now, devil, if I go out of here by cancer, then I go out of here by cancer, but I will never bow my knee, and I will never turn away from my Savior, and I will never bow down to him that one iota. In Jesus' name. And that's where we have to get. Amen? He didn't bring us this far to leave us. And I'm not turning back and going to Egypt. They said, oh, the leeks and the onions were wonderful. Yeah, but they had taskmasters raping your daughters, beating you with whips. And all you remember is the leeks and the onions. I remember that when I served, when I served the world, when I was in the world, the devil left me alone. No, he didn't. He was a Pied Piper leading you to disaster. Hell! <laughs> That's just crazy. You know, John chapter 6, my, one, of, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Jesus is telling them they need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, you know. 
my, my flesh is, is bread and meat indeed, and my, my uh, blood is drink indeed. And they were freaking out, and they all left. And then here's his 12, and he turns to them, and he just simply says, will you leave too? And Peter's like, we don't have a clue. They won't read this. You don't have a clue what you just met. Where will we go, he says. You have the words to eternal life. Where, where will we go? The doctor says, told this one guy, my, pros, my uh, PSA number was 18.3. This guy was 1,000. He didn't even know he had anything. And he, tried, he got out of bed one morning, fell flat on the floor because he couldn't walk. And it metastasized into his bones and into his lungs. So his wife got him to the hospital. And, a, and the doctor said, you got a PSA of 1,000. There's absolutely zero we can do for you. So he went home and he called this friend of his who was a nutritionist. Now listen, he, he was a, a vegan. That's all he ate was vegetables. A lot of good that did him, huh? So, so that's what he said too. A lot of good that did me. So he asked his nutritionist friend, he said, I'm going to give you what to eat. And you got to eat it. First thing was salmon. Then he actually said some steak, some chicken, and, and then other things too, vegetables and so forth to put together. After six months, he went in and his PSA number was 0. 0.6. And he has zero prosthetic prostate cancer. And he's got a little bit of cancer in his bone and lungs left. They said, you're going to die. Go home and get your house in order. So he had pictures on the YouTube vid of him walking with his daughter uh, for her wedding, still alive. But it was a fight. It was a struggle. And he didn't get into it, but he said he talked to a friend of his in Greece spiritually speaking that's what he said I don't know was it some weird stuff or was it Jesus he just didn't want to talk about it in a video you know I don't know but you know the thing is the thing is you know look at look at what they said they were about to be thrown into a fiery fire you know what that would like would burn through your head now just shoot me in the head let me die fast don't put me in some fire so I can burn them to death Nero was putting them up on poles, soaked them in oil, and set their robes on fire and made lights down the streets. And they wouldn't denounce the Lord. Even after seeing him that he has done that, knowing that how they screamed in pain and agony, they still refused to bow to Nero. And they died being put up on the wall as a light. And people could see him burning and hear their screams until it stopped. Even knowing that, they still refused to bow. So they knew. I mean, they've seen Nebuchadnezzar do terrible things. They knew. Everybody was so fearful because they knew he would put them in the fiery furnace. So he's de they're denying. Now who is speaking here? Is it Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Or is it Hananiah, the favor of God? Michelle, who is like God, and Azariah, the protection of God. Who's speaking like that against the devil? You can't resist the devil, people. Come on. He's had too much time. He's eternal. He's going to like a fire forever. He's powerful. He is now. Don't, don't kid yourself. Oh, he's a ninny. He's a wimp. Look what he's done. He's, this guy is powerful. He's got deception down to an art. He loves to deceive Christians. Oh, man that bite into that. He knows what he's doing. Nebuchadnezzar was the guy. I mean, even God recognized him as the guy. But you're not God. And for seven years, he crawled on the ground and ate grass as an ox. When Nebuchadnezzar woke up, he went, God is God. He thought he was something. So who's speaking? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Or Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah? That's who was speaking. You can, you can be covered in cancer and, and an old person dying and everything else, but inside you're young, strong, healed. So who's going to speak? Who's going to speak? The Lord said, I have written a new name for you. I'm going to speak. That name is going to speak. Greater is he who is in me and he who is in the world. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. 
Now let's finish the story. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them in the burning, fiery furnace. Now, there's a problem here with these big mighty men because he told them to, to bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But there's no such thing as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who did they bind up? And these men were bound in their, in their coats and trousers with turbans and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Wow. So these mighty men burnt up, you know. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, you know, I mean, my mind goes kind of flip-flop. There's no such thing as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, there's no such thing, since you're born again, as the person we see in the mirror. That person ceased to exist a long time ago. If I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, all things have passed away. All things have become new. You know, I'm not Jimmy Jeffries anymore. I'm by some name I don't even know yet. It's written in heaven. That's the name. When I get there, he's going to call me by that name. And I'm going to know it because down inside I know it, but I don't know it in the flesh. See, you, you ceased to exist. You became a new creation in Christ Jesus. Why are we continuing in this old creation? I put on Christ, it said. I clothed myself in Christ. I, don't, I cease to exist. I lost my identity. 1 Corinthians 6 says, I don't even own myself. He paid a price and he owns me. The money I have in my wallet doesn't even belong to me. My house doesn't belong to me. My car doesn't belong to me. Amen? So I can walk in forgiveness if something happens. So they fell down in that. In that well, the reason why I didn't get burnt is because those guys don't exist. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I don't know about you. I got goosebumps right now from the top of my head and the bottom of my feet. Because I don't care what the world says. I had a doctor told me this other things in the past that didn't even pan out in my life. You know, they, they doctors. That's what they're going to talk. But my Lord knows better. Amen. And if you go into the fire, guess what? Jesus is going to be right there. He has promised to never leave you. He's promised that. Well, it's not that he can't leave, because I won't say he can't leave you, but you're tied to him now. So I say, okay, Lord, if you're going to leave, you're going to be dragging me along with you. I'm hooked to you. So he said, well, I'm leaving, and then I'm, I guess I'm going to leave too. I'm not going to stay if you're not. Amen? He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. Even when the pain's unbearable. And I was laying on that biopsy table, which hopefully nobody in here does that. Brad did. Brad might be. Anybody had a, any guys had a biopsy on your prostate? You did? <laughs> okay. Brad's about the only one. So I found out what Brad went through. Worst thing on the planet. Stuck 18 needles in my prostate. And uh, I was in midstream. Doctors down there, two nurses, they'd taken chunks of my prostate. And I started to lose it un incredibly. I almost, I was ready to kick that doctor through the wall. <laughs> I'm in a fetal position, and I was about to let loose some, this, my two feet was going to kick this guy. And I couldn't handle it. I was getting totally overwhelmed. And my favorite scripture, how many of you know my favorite scripture? Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And I said at that moment, I need your strength. I didn't even have the word out of my mouth. 
And this overwhelming presence came in so strong that I started joking with the doctor. I went from wanting to kick him through the wall to, hey doc, you know my prostate's only the size of a walnut and you're taking out more than enough, I think. <laughs> I don't think I have a prostate left. He said, I'm turning it into Swiss cheese. And everybody's laughing, including myself. But then I think about it, that wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, I was about to lose it. And I just, my scripture came rolling back into my being and his strength came in. Four times after that, even when I was home, the strength of God I called on. And before I finished, that scripture was not here anymore. It's part of my being. He is my strength. He's my high tower. He's my buckler, my shield. He's a mighty fortress. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. You need to find you a scripture and build yourself up on it. Build your foundation on where you are on that scripture. Know it. Understand it. Look it up in trans different translations. Get to know it. Look it up in Greek if it's, in, if it's one of the scriptures that's in the New Testament. If it's in Hebrew and Old Testament, look that up. It's still for you. All the promises are yes and amen from Old and New Testament belong to you. Find the one you need. And that is Jesus. He's the Word of God. Amen. Come on now. I'll give you these two scriptures real quick, then we're going to pray. Romans 8, 35 through 39. <clears throat> Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall cancer, shall diseases, shall starvation? Who shall, you know, tribulation, or uh, shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine? That would be starvation. Or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now that's interesting what he's saying there because he's talking about him and his ministry. He's talking about what he was doing for, for the Romans, Corinthians and everybody else that he was writing to. And he said he and his ministry and the people with him were killed all the day long. They went through, through some serious stuff and getting the church started. So here I am standing in front of you facing cancer. And I'm going through this, but is it for you? It's for anybody. It's for Bruce this morning. It's for everybody in here that faces something. I'm telling you how I'm going to do it, and you need to do it the same way. You need to follow what the scriptures say. I'm following Paul into these things that I'm facing. I have been in many pits and, and um, tough spots in my Christian walk. And let me tell you, the Lord has never failed me. Brought me through every time. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. It's the enemy's persecution. What did we do to deserve it? Just living on this planet. It's other things. Some of y'all have had back things, huh, Tony? Amen. Deborah? Kidney stones. Having a stroke, Sister Mary. The Lord never leaves us. We go through it. We're not exempt. Sometimes people get a healing. One of my best friends who died some years back as pastor of, of Amazing Love Church, Pastor George, they had thousands of prayers going up. The funeral parlor was so packed out that you, there was no, only standing room only. And when his wife Jody got up and preached, she just said, when it's time to go, all the prayers in the world not going to stop it. When God says it's time. And he was sitting in the hospital at 11, 11 weeks. with tube down him. He took it out for a while. And he had COVID. And he couldn't breathe. If he got up to stand up, he would fall because his oxygen levels would drop. So she stayed with him the whole time. And she was so tired. And, jo and he said to her, don't go to sleep. Jesus is coming tonight. And uh, so she went, well, okay. well, she so tired she went to sleep on the sofa. 
So that when she woke up, she went, did Jesus come? He said, yeah, he came. He came in. He was in the room. And he said, I'm going home. So she said, oh, that would be great. She was thinking, back to their house. The next day, his blood pressure just, and he was gone. He went home. He got his healing, you know. And Jody's still out ministering. You know, yeah, she was grieving. And it was a rough thing, especially for everybody who was praying. There was prophecies came out by people saying, you're going to be healed and this and that. I wonder how they feel right now. You know, I'm not going to kid anybody. I definitely don't sugar, I don't sugarcoat anything. We just don't know what the end will be, end result will be. But we do have one thing we can do, and that is to stay faithful, stay connected, keep our faith upon the Lord. Amen? Amen. And glorify Him in wherever we are. Thank you, Jesus. You know? But we do have exceeding promises. I've told this to you guys so long and so many times, so many long ago. I just simply said, I never go in and pray anything other than life. That's where I will always stand in my prayers. And many times it was, it, it was life. I mean, it was people got healed. Amen. Some went home. But I will never preach that kind of stuff because the Lord would be upset with me. We are always to speak life. We are always to be edifying and uplifting. You know, whatever you face, you got to know that God is for you. So please stand to your feet. I want to anoint you this morning. If you are going through something, I want to anoint Bruce again. And um, Deatro, we want to be praying for her. She's not here, but, you know, amen. But I'll just anoint her daughter. <laughs> So if, you, if you're facing something physical, come on up. <clears throat> you know, in this message this morning, you know, you saw a lot. There was a lot in that, in that message. And I was thinking later, I, I, changed, I had to change my PowerPoint on my, my, my flash drive and my papers three times as I kept thinking of other stuff. I said, Lord, this thing's going to go on for two days if you keep showing me things. But there's, so, even, there's even more stuff in the story. It's just incredible. Every time I think I got the definition of something, the definition gets bigger. It's like, whoa. I mean, you could take each of the, each of the names because in the, in the Hebrew, the names mean like, for instance, Jehovah is our helper. You get into the Hebrew and it starts to tell you what kind of helper he is. So that's message could go on forever. The word of God goes on forever. Amen. Wow. Every one of y'all facing something uh, physical? Wow. Amen. One of my prayers about what's happening with me, and I've been coming down here in the mornings and, 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 and praying for an hour for Bruce and for others and for Deitra, and uh, is that I'm asking God for a healing manifestation where they don't have to be touched or prayed over. Just come listen to the word and be healed. Amen. And he hasn't denied me it. I don't know if it's here right now. I don't know, but I just know I asked him for that. And uh, we'll just have to see. But amen. I want to come down and I'm just going to go right down and anoint y'all. And then I want to pray a prayer. Thank you, Lord. If anything I discovered going through whatever fire I have been through is that there's these times that you're in his presence, you're praying and you feel absolutely nothing. And when I started Monday morning to say, this is something I've been wanting to do and now I'm doing it one hour in the morning. I set my phone and my, and for one hour and I just walk around here and praying, praying the spirit and so forth. And, um, and when I started, I felt nothing. But God confirmed something. I want to tell you a little testimony real quick. On Monday, after that hour, I went home and then I made, wrote out the deposit, church deposit, went to the bank. And uh, when I got there, there was an old man, probably in his 80s, he, was, he got out of his car. He was moving pretty quick. And my thinking was, I'm going to get to the door before him. I'm going to go in so when I get to the teller. You know, I mean, that's just my flesh. And I was like, no, I don't do that. So I made it to the door and I opened it for him and he thanked me and he went in. 
And there was only one teller, two were open, but only one lady, and one, in the first she went, he went straight to her. So I got in line, and the other lady came in. So I was right next to him, okay? So he was real loud, because he's an old guy. That's how we are, us old guys. We were real loud. And um, the lady asked him, how are you doing? And he said, not good. So I kind of glanced over at him when he said that. So then he talked about the money that he wanted to take out. And then the lady working with mine, she looked over like that to, to him so she could see him. And she went, she named him. I forgot what his name was. How you doing? And he turned to her. And now he's real loud. And I'm standing right here. I'm listening. He said, I just came back from the doctor. And I have a mass right here. He said, the doctor said, we cannot do surgery. You won't make it. And so he said to the doctor, how long do I have? And the doctor said, well, you're going to start wheezing and your breathing should become harder and then it, you're going to just be gone. And he said, well, now it's just totally up to, to the Lord, to God, he said. So <clears throat> then he got back to the money and then he finished and went by a table because then I was standing there. I mean, I'm hearing all of this. I'm overwhelmed by God's presence. Like, you can't let this guy leave without praying for him. So I'm now saying, well, you got to, I'm not, she's not finished with mine. You got to stop him. So he goes by the table, like right there. And so the lady finished with mine, gave it to me. And I walked over to him, I put my hand on his back. And I said, can I pray for you? And I said it kind of low. And he said, I'm sorry. I said, can I pray for you? And he said, he said, yeah. So man, I started praying. I just said, Lord, this man's about to go into eternity. And I pray that he is ready. I pray that he knows Jesus Christ and that he will call on his name. And I said a few couple of other things. And then I said, and then I stopped and I just said, God bless you. And he just looked at me and said, thank you like that. And that was it. But it was God that set the whole thing up. The timing, everything. There's no way... You know, I mean, there's it, always a coincidence something could happen, but that was set up. So I got to pray with this man, and that was it. That's all I had to do because now, because he received it, God's dealing with him. He might even be in eternity right now. I don't know. But amen. But, when, but my point is, is this. As you start your journey in prayer, you're going to have those dark times where you don't feel him. And that's when the enemy shows up to stop you. Man, when I was here, probably around Thursday morning, I, I was like, I'm not, I just felt like gone. And so I just, you know, shut it down early. I only got 15 minutes to go. And then I realized, who, who is at the root of this? So then I went and pushed the clock forward and to even more time. I said, you're not going to win, devil. I almost gave in to that. I almost yielded to walking out of this church early when I've committed myself to an hour. So I want longer than that. Amen. So you got to understand who's going to try to stop you. You saw the prayers aren't working. I mean, we've been praying for Bruce and it seems to be getting worse. That's just the devil. God's got this thing. He's got this. It's not getting worse to God. Imagine Job sitting in his ash pile, scraping skin worms out of his body. And the wife said, curse God and die. Just give up on him. What? You speak as a foolish woman. I came in the world with nothing, and I'll leave with nothing. Bless his name. But that's not how it happened. And that's not what happened. He was blessed twofold. He was blessed twice. And he was alive and lived to see even the new kids, babies, grow up and Amen. Give twice as much as he had. You know, that's our destiny. If you do go home be with the Lord, then you go home be with the Lord. <laughs> that's even great, right? But if not, glorify him. Glorify him. Give him praise. Amen. Let's pray. Close your eyes for just a second. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, Lord, for your presence, for your truth. We thank you, Father, because you never leave us. You never forsake us. You're with us throughout our whole life, through every ordeal. For we are on paths of righteousness for your namesake. But there are potholes. There are bumps in the road. And with your help, we will come through. 
So I pray for all of these this morning. And I lift them up that they will know. Don't veer away. Don't turn. Don't give up. A miracle is in your future. Thank you, Father, right now. And I speak healing in this place. Healing from heaven. Touch Deatra right now, Lord, where she is. Touch Bruce. Touch all of these with the different things in their backs. Things going on inside of them. We have loved ones that's not here because they are home having some physical issues for Crystal. We just pray for her. Just lift all of these up in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Glory to God.